Hi, I'm Hillary Clinton. Let's have our devotion. We're in Acts chapter 15. Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this issue. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Anytime you see Jesus plus something else, it's the classic formula for heresy. And it's, it's easy to spot here in the Judaizers whom Paul, when he writes the book of Galatians to address this issue, and he's ticked about it. I mean, like if you wanna, if you wanna see Paul angry, read Galatians, he's righteously angry. He, sa- he tells them to do it to themselves and to go all the way, all right? It, it just just use, per, use context clues to figure out what he means by that. This is the word of God. That's how angry he is because you have these Gentiles who are getting saved and these Jewish elites were like, no, they need to be circumcised according to the law of Moses and they need to obey the law of Moses or they can't be saved. And that's just absolute satanic nonsense. This council at Jerusalem is important because the gospel is worth defending. It's being corrupted and Paul and Barnabas are advocates for the truth of the gospel. Not one person at that meeting is as educated as Paul. Not one of those other Pharisees had the kind of tutelage and pedigree and background and credentials that Paul had. So he understood the law of Moses better than any of his opponents in this debate, but they weren't neutral. This was not God's will. These were people who professed belief in God, but who were pushing legalism to the detriment of the advancement of the gospel. You can always tell when an idea is satanic just based on its fruits, what results it produces. Does it result in people being saved? Great. Praise God. Does it result in people being saved plus some nonsense on the side? Hey, that's the book of Acts so far. Does it result in just division and the gospel not being shared and ministry stopping and the exclusion of others? It's just pure satanic division and God hates it. There are seven things that God despises and those who sow division among the brethren are among those things which the book of Proverbs describes. God hates this. God hates this. This is gonna come up when we study more about First and Second Timothy and Titus, because both Timothy and Titus were protégés of Paul's, and they disagreed on this matter. In our modern day context, we don't have a whole lot of people who are arguing that you need to be circumcised in order to be saved, but we have the same debate still happening. If you've ever been taught that you need to speak in tongues to be saved, point them to Acts 15. If you've ever been told that you need to adhere to the doctrines of grace and be a five-point Dortian Calvinist in order to be saved, point them here to Acts chapter 15. If you've ever been told that you need to believe the gospel plus these finer points on non-gospel centric issues, point them to Acts chapter 15. This is a prototype for something that will come up elsewhere. This is also something that's still relevant today, unfortunately. uh, For example, my brothers and sisters in the Church of Christ, you don't need to be baptized in order to be saved. You are adhering to, even though you're not arguing for circumcision, you're actually arguing for the Old Testament mark of the covenant if you argue, argue for circumcision. When you argue for baptism as though it were salvific, you're arguing the same exact idea. The man who was on the cross next to Jesus, we know for certain, he's one of only two people in the ministry of Jesus that we know for full Christ-like authority is in heaven because he's one of those people that Jesus said is saved. Zacchaeus was one, the man on the cross next to him was another. Today you will be with me in paradise. That man did not have a copy of Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology or the truncated version, which I call Lil Wayne, He didn't have adherence to the five points of Calvinism. That wouldn't come up for centuries later. He didn't know what tulips stood for. He didn't care, but he was going to heaven with Jesus. 
He wasn't baptized, but he was told by Jesus he was going to heaven. He didn't speak in tongues, but he was told by Jesus he was going to heaven. It's almost as though Romans 10, 9 is true. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So is Romans 10, 9 true, or was God lying when he inspired it? Which is it? Acts 15 was an archetype for something that comes up over and over again and still exists within the church today. It's called legalism, as though Jesus' work were insufficient and we need to supplement it with some work of the flesh. It's satanic and it's ancient, but it's relevant and it's current. Acts 15, my friends, just wait until you see what Paul, and now our boy Peter is gonna come back to contribute to this debate. Don't be fooled, Christ is sufficient. There's not a thing you could do to add to his atoning work on the cross. Get over yourself, you're not that powerful. Christ did all of the work on the cross and he rose again. So carry this forward, set people free from legalism and don't be entrapped in it yourself. This is beautiful news. It's the book of Acts and it's happening today. So let's continue living out the book of Acts. Are you ready? Go.